Good evening to distinguished uh, council uh, members here, especially my, in fact, this is a very interesting table. All the men and women here are people that uh, I have uh, interacted with as a junior person in the past. So, starting from Chief uh, Ekundayo, Alaje Malami. In fact, uh, Alaje Malami was uh, the Sarkin Sudan of Uno when I did my youth call in uh, Sokoto. So, I mean, don't ask me when. <laughs> and uh, he and I have kept uh, a wonderful uh, son father relationship. And when he heard about this outing, he came all the way to join us. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I have uh, a big organ there too. <laughs> Ch chicken ones. <laughs> That is uh, our, we call in Delta, you know, Delta, we call it Diopa means uh, elder. <laughs> That's our Diopa. <laughs> and uh, Benny, Benny has not changed. He looks the same way she was, like when she was in banking. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to be here this evening. And I'd like to thank uh, IOD for the opportunity of discussing a very topical uh, issue or concept, which is corporate governance, especially from my own perspective. I'd like to thank them for inviting me to make, share my perspectives in a very iconic and historical place, the Metropolitan Club. Maybe after today, I'll become a, I'll become a member. Does that come with you? On our, on our own for this uh, event. <laughs> the topic of today is uh, building a global conglomerate on corporate governance values, challenges and benefits in the developing world. And as the chair added, more importantly from my own perspective, in some of the conglomerates of businesses who are built, anchored on strong principles of corporate governance. I know your president and chair. Um, she were lucky to have her as a chairman of one of our investing companies. She's the chairman of uh, Afri Prudential Registrars. And what she preached here, she displays in the way she directs the affairs of the board. And so I, the IOD is not only known for San, for promoting sound corporate governance practices, she has helped in this instance to practice what the IOD uh, promotes. So I'd like to congratulate the council for having her as your chairperson and president. <laughs> I'll approach this topic from three perspectives. One is what, two is how, and three is why. You know, this issue of corporate, sound corporate governance has become extremely topical in the world today. We've had cases of uh, failed companies, both in Nigeria and outside the world. Some of them have been quite, quite huge, quite monumental. And uh, following the failed corporate failures, people have started talking more about corporate governance. And I thought that for us to talk, have this conversation in a meaningful manner, we need to start from what exactly is this concept, this concept of corporate governance, what does it mean? Then we'll talk about why do companies even bother to develop sound corporate governance policies and even practice them? What are the benefits and what challenges they go through in developing this? And finally, we should talk about how do you go about developing so you know what it is, you want to do it, how do you go about it? And all of this, I will talk briefly about uh, our own experience in developing, implementing, and using COPS and corporate governance frameworks and practices to grow the businesses that we have grown over time. So there are three definitions among so many, and by the way, the chairman gave her own definition when she spoke. I wish I knew, I saw a paper in advance, I would have added it as a fourth <laughs> definition. I would like to start with the one by Mervyn King. Mervyn King uh, chaired the King Committee on Corporate Governance, which is called today King's Code. 
He views corporate governance simply as a system by which companies are directed and controlled. Directed and controlled. Let's keep this in perspective. We have a second definition by the OECD. In 1999, OECD published its principles of corporate governance and described corporate governance as the internal means by which corporates are operated and controlled. So again, control comes in. The internal means by which corporates are operated and controlled, which involve a set of relationships between a company's management, its board, its shareholders, and other stakeholders. And the third one I would like to share, it comes from your institute, the Institute of Directors Europe. And it defines corporate governance. It says corporate governance is about establishing a framework of company processes and attitudes that add value to the business, helps its reputation, and ensure its long-term continuity and success. Long-term continuity and success. So I find this, I like, particularly like these three definitions, and that's why I decided to share them. And of course, I like the definition by the chair, because chair's definition is very interesting. She defined governance from a more holistic or broader perspective, and says it's not just about corporates, but even the government. And I will add a third, and even the NGOs. I like these three definitions because they contain what I consider extremely important in running businesses today. Uh, they talk about long-term continuity and success. They talk about a set of relationships between a company's management and its board, shareholders and other stakeholders. So corporate governance is not only good from point of view of directing and controlling a company, is good for the intended outcome of making sure you create a long-term, a company that exists in the long term, and a company that succeeds, and a company whose success is measured, not just in terms of the shareholders of the business, but the wider stakeholders. And so if we know all of these parameters, it helps further in the kind of way we go about shaping or defining or setting up our corporate governance framework and practices. So the point, therefore, is why do companies even bother to lay out good corporate governance standards and also practice them? There are various reasons. The chair, again, in opening remarks, has uh, referred uh, mentioned a few of them. So I'll just quickly run through some. There's corporate reputation issue. It helps you to enhance your corporate reputation if you are well governed as an institution. It helps in transparency and accountability to shareholders and the wider stakeholders. It helps long-term continuity and success of business. And of course, it helps to attract and retain good workers. Workers that will help you grow even the business better. And it helps to attract capital that is needed in most businesses. There's almost every business in this capital. Maybe only Amazon of Pharmaceuticals does not need capital, capital here. But almost every business needs capital. So when you have good a company that is well run, set up of sound principles of corporate governance, and, and practice very well, investors pay a premium to invest and become part of those companies. And so that is a clear, a clear benefit. So knowing what this concept is about and knowing why people, institutions should bother about it. How do you go about it if you even decided that you want to now run your company the right way? I like to share both some theoretical approaches, but more importantly, how I and the businesses I run have gone about this. The first thing in trying to run a company very well is to set up to have a charter. You know, you have a country must have constitution, and similar to a country having a constitution, is that you have corporate governance code, your own charter, your principles, your value, your, the rules 
that govern and guide how you want to govern your institution. But in doing this, there are key elements you need to factor in, you need to bring in, and we've done this in our uh, institutions. First, you need to understand the extent, the policies, the rules of the country where you're operating, or countries where you're operating, where this is going to be applied. So in Nigeria, you need to understand what does the concern say about private ownership of businesses, what does Kama say about businesses, extremely important, because you cannot put in place internal governance code as a variance with what the, the, the country says. Second thing is to look at the memat, the article and memorandum of association of the company. Does it allow you to put some of the policy you want to put? What does it even say? So you need to look at that. Third thing is sector regulators or regulation. Depending on the sector you're playing in, there will be some regulation. If it's healthcare, there might be NAVDAC rules. If it's banking, there might be central bank. Insurance, there might be NICOM. Investment banking, capital market, there might be SEC. You just look at the rules in the areas you want to operate in. Then, best, global best practice. Because the world we live in today is a globalized world. And what is good in country A, whether it's developing country or develop, should be good for everyone everywhere. So you need to look at this. And last point is, and not the least, your corporate values as an institution. Every organization has corporate values, whether written or unwritten. You need to capture this and make, see how you codify this in your corporate governance. So when you have a charter, it's a good starting point for the journey in corporate governance, to have your own internal organizational charter duly approved by your board, the board being the highest level of the organization, duly approved. Then you know that you have a framework that you can use to start the journey of corporate governance. Second thing is it's good to induct board members. Because corporate governance starts right at the top. Corporate governance does not start at the bottom. All of us at the top must understand, embrace, practice, jealously guide, and reinforce at every single opportunity we have the values, the ethos, the principles, and what the rules contain in our governance charter. So you endure the board, then the management, it should cascade the entire system. Everybody should understand what the code is for the organization. The third one is to try, it's not just enough to have the best policy. You have a policy, but you need to make sure that you practice it. So in everything I've been saying, you have talking about practice, practice, practice. Develop the policy, but more importantly, practice what you have developed. So the second thing is to ensure that you have a board assessment and monitoring mechanism that helps you to ensure that the corporate governance standards you put in place, uh, which helps the board to control and operate, to control and direct businesses that they are actually being complied with. Then the tough one. The tough one is that we need to allow the policies to work. We need to allow the policies to work. So we're not just putting in place policies for some we should put in place policies for all of us. So the policy put in place, we need to allow it to work. It should be no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. And I tell you, for instance, you know, so the chair said I should share my own experience. So indulge me if I say certain things. So in, uh, we, Transcore Hotel is one of our subsidiaries. And we have some policies that guide what we op operate, how we do things. I visit Abuja almost every week or every two weeks, and I stay at the Hilton Hotel. I've never stayed at the Hilton Hotel without paying. Even though we own it, I stay and I pay because I must lead by good example. If they have corporate discount to corporations, they will give the same corporate discount to S audience. But as a shareholder, I'll have my dividends. <laughs> but let them do the business in line with how we have said it should be done. Now, if I subject myself to that level of accountability or probity, people who work under me can't do otherwise. They can't do no less. So we need to put policies in place and make sure we practice them. Everything, every policy we have in an organization, the sound governance details at the top must practice it. When you practice it, it tells a strong, it sends a strong signal in the system. So we need to allow policies to work. 
We need to appoint CEOs that are good, and it's a core function of the board, and it's a key pillar of sound governance practices in organizations. Where you are lucky, <laughs> is it luck? Where you have a good CEO, corporate governance standards to a large extent will, will, will be strong. If you have a strong board, good policies, everyone respects the policies, then you have a good CEO, you have, you're on the right journey. I've always said in my assessment of CEOs before board members, boards should encourage, get good CEOs, and when you get a good CEO, if the CEO is doing the right thing, continue to encourage the CEO. If the CEO is not doing the right thing, have zero tolerance for non-compliance. We do not run institutions to keep changing CEOs. And so where we have CEOs that are compliant, it's good for success. You know, no organization wants to start changing CEOs every day, even though the board has the authority to change CEOs. But it's good to select the right CEO who is a fair balance between ability to create value in terms of profitability, ability to project the right image for the entity, ability to understand, enforce, and comply with rules of the organization. So it's not just good to have a CEO that is strong in one area, but so you might have a CEO that is very strong in bringing business to the table, but you don't have, the CEO is not strong in complying with rules. Don't appoint that person as a CEO. I would rather appoint somebody on a scale of one to 10, somebody who will produce six over 10 profitability than, than somebody, but highly compliant, than appoint someone who will give me eight and a half or nine over 10 profitability for not compliant. Because in the long run, that performer will destroy value for the entity. The one who is growing, the one who is strong, not so strong on profitability, but abide by the rules of the organization would definitely create longer term value for shareholders. And by the way, we must always remember that this business of governance and building institutions to last is a long-term business. It's not a short-term business. It is short-term motives and motivation that drive businesses to, and the boards to make wrong decisions that turn up in the letter to hurt the organizations. There should be zero tolerance for contravention. Costly. The compliance is very costly, but uh, the benefits can be very, very significant in the long run. And um, it's, it's good to create internal awareness. So internal awareness, you know, if a company is well governed, it, from time to time you need to review your governance practices and see where the things that are obsolete, things you need to change, and things you need to add on. Whatever you do to your governance document, create internal awareness, have internal seminars, meet at the board level, have the board governance committee discuss these issues, and make sure it cascades, it goes down the system. Everyone must know the values, corporate values that the organization uphold, and how the organization likes to be governed. And there must be strict enforcement. Most companies, a company should have very strong company sectarian as a mechanism for having strong corporate governance environment. If you have a very good company secretary, chances are that the business, the corporate governance environment will be strong. I've argued from a certain experiences in the, not experience, but certain things we've read about some failed businesses, both in our environment and outside. I've often argued that if they had good secretariat, good corporate secretariat, chances that they might not have gone that far the way they were. So it's important to have very good company secretaries to help companies know when they are derailing, help the board know when they are derailing, at least bring it to the attention of the board that this is not in line with what we say we do, and let the board, if they decide to override them, so let it be on record that you have advised appropriately. Very, very important. I'd like to share a little experience about what we did at Transnational Corporation of Nigeria, Transport. So when we took over in Transcore 2011, most of you know the story of Transcore at the time. 
Transco had not uh, published an their annual accounts for years. Transco had been sanctioned by SEC, different sanctions. I recall the first week we had to go to SEC for meet. Uh, the, even the shareholding structure, the ownership of Transco was not clear, was not known, was not clear. We had unreconciled about three to five billion shares unreconciled in terms of ownership of the company. We had 99 court cases, 99 court legal litigations in the company. <laughs> and of course, uh, Transco had never paid dividends before. No dividend. The market cap then was about 11 billion naira. And uh, so what did we do? We did some of the things I just talked about. First, uh, we, we I decided that we need to have create internal awareness. In change management program, one of the reasons change programs succeed is when you have sufficient internal mobilization and buying into a vision. And also when you create what is called a high D, high dissatisfaction with status quo. You need to let people know that this thing, the status quo is not acceptable. When you do that and you're able to galvanize internal mobilization, by people involved, internal stakeholders, the change effort is likely to succeed. So what I did was we, we, we had internal sessions about governance. We decided to turn around Transco on the platform of co co sound corporate governance. And we had internal sessions. Then we had meeting with Nigerian Stock Exchange. If I recall, I think your president was in attendance. We had meeting with Nigerian Stock Exchange. We invited them to come and talk to us about compliance, about regulation, how they see it. Since Transco was a company that was not compliant at the time. So we did all of this. We invited SEC also. The director of uh, operations SEC came. We had a weekend session. They told us their requirements, what they expect from a PLC, a good company. What they told. And almost all of us were in the audience in the hall. So it was clear, and we made a resolution that we need to run this company in a different way. And so that was the first thing we did. And I'll tell you that that internal mobilization of people was very good. It helped to date in what we have done in Transco. And in fact, uh, to the satisfaction, amazement, or satisfaction, happiness, pride of all of us, uh, Nigerian Stock Exchange named Transco the most compliant company on the Stock Exchange in 2014. This was just three years, 2009, 11 to 13, from a company that was sanctioned you know, to a company that now being rated as the best in terms of compliance. And this was possible because we created internal awareness and internal cohesion, a unified unity of, uh, of a purpose that we will run this company in a better way, and we achieved it. So to others who are about to start, who have not started, who are about to start, don't be discouraged. You too can run a global uh, a company that globally acclaimed in terms of compliance. The second thing we did was to now prepare proper corporate governance documents. You know, put in place. Some people play the key role there. Angela Nicky is here. She she was the main driver of the Angela. Please stand for recognition. For the very place. Thank you. We did this and again approved it. And then we started the journey. And as I said, today we are happy for this. We have serious zero tolerance for non-compliance. Everyone has to comply with, from my level, from my level to everyone. I you know people watch. You know when you hear people say organizations walk their talk, then it means they say something, they do it. And when you hear they don't walk their talk, then they say something, but they do a different thing. People watch, and in fact, to a large extent, even what the actions are easier to for people to emulate and, and, and study, understudy than uh, what you say. So it's important that in this corporate governance journey that we lead from the top and not from, 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 from the bottom. The same experience at uh, United Bank of Africa, that is a 70-year-old decision, so it's totally different. But what we do or did and continue to do is to keep improving the governance standards. You know, I say to people, corporate governance, sound corporate governance is a long journey. It's not, it's not a short-term destination. So you need to keep improving, 
keep improving. It's not enough. You can never have a static state to say, I have attained the highest level of corporate governance. No. You might attain the highest level at point zero or at point one T, but you need to keep improving because that's also improving and things keep changing the mark in the place. So you need to keep learning and uh, improving how you do things. We, so again, at San UBA, a lot has happened and, um, and, and the, the market continues to reward it for how the level of governance standards will uphold. And UBA Africa continues to enjoy from that uh, governance uh, standard we operate in 19 African countries. And on record, when the United States introduced the Patriot Act, most African banks left the United States of America. The only African bank that remains and continues to operate in the United States of America today is United Bank of Africa. We operate in New York. <laughs> this is for two reasons. One, we believe we'll be able to withstand the heightened regulatory environment in the US at this point in time. And equally um, uh, key is the fact that we believe in the robust governance system that we have and we will practice in the, in, the, in the bank. I'd like to begin to, let me, let me talk about some learning, some learning points, or I won't say conclusion, but uh, you, know, you don't want to, I don't stand between people and dinner, or is it lunch? <laughs> so I want to make it, uh, I, want to, I want to begin to bring it together, and we hope that, um, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. Corporate governance is an ongoing conversation. It's, uh, it's evolving in the world. You can see when the OECD defined their own corporate governance principle was 1999. I'd like to say Nigeria is not doing badly. We can do better. Uh, but the institutions like the IOD are doing a great job. The key regulatory authorities we have in Nigeria, Central Bank, SEC, NICOM, PENCOM, they are doing a great job, especially FRC, which I'll talk about soon. So I'd like to draw a few, a few, a few comments or pattern shots. You know. One is um, corporate governance, almost like the chair said too, should not be limited to businesses. Corporate governance should not be limited to businesses. NGOs should adopt corporate governance standards. So <laughs> we saw what happened recently or oh, it's ongoing about um, FIFA. FIFA is not a business, so to speak, and they felt they cooperate the way they like. But we live in a different world today, in an interdependent and interrelated world that we live in, and a world where people want the best in terms of governance. So it's not just enough to look at businesses when we talk about corporate governance. We need to also look at non-businesses, organizations, that are accountable to the public or to people should embrace sound corporate governance standards. Two is a second point. All businesses should develop corporate governance codes and religiously, meticulously implement them, practice them, and have zero tolerance for contravention or exceptions. Three. Corporate governance practitioners should not leave the business of state governance to only politicians. Corporate governance practitioners should begin to show interest in national politics, in national affairs, how we are governed. Because what is good for the corporate is good for the people. And we have seen that there's a direct correlation between sound corporate governance practices in environments and economic development and progress. So we have to begin to deliberately encourage and inject into our public life people who have held themselves to the highest level of accountability of corporate governance in private institutions. Three, four, we have, we should begin to build businesses as, because the topic says developing world. But initially I said, well, developing and develop, they're the same in terms of corporate governance. In fact, I've argued that there are certain practices that the developed world should learn from developing countries. 
in on corporate governance. But one of the areas we have not done so well as uh, Africans, so to speak, is that we have not been able to grow our businesses to outlive us. We have not built, we have not succeeded in building most of our businesses to live forever. That is the difference between a General Electric and a local company here. Why General Electric, decades, hundreds of years, doing the same thing, improving on what they're doing, longevity helps in the long run to build iconic national, international, global institutions. So we need to commence that journey. But for, to commence that journey, we need to have a strong foundation of sound corporate governance practices. And that is why what the IOD is doing is good in creating awareness about corporate governance. We, need to, we don't need to stop here. We need to continue to propagate, to create the awareness, and partner with similar-minded organizations to, to make this happen. Because I believe firmly that that is a strong, strong pillar for building our organizations to, to, to last. We should not make mockery of governance, I wrote here. I, I, you know, I can't stop talking about practice, 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 what we write or what we preach or what we document. I said, we do, don't make mockery of gov governance codes. Practice what you have set as your own rules. You know, this corporate governance to a large extent is internal. It's just now that some bodies are trying to come together and specify minimum codes. But to a large extent, it's you, the evolution, more of you, how you want to run your business, etc. So we need to make sure that what we have embraced as our policies, the corporate governance framework to guide what we do, that we implement with practice. In. Again, as I said before, corporate governance, sound corporate governance is a journey. It's not necessarily a destination. You need to keep improving, to tell yourself, you need to keep doing well in what you do, and just keep the journey. So no one should ever rest on this or us that we are there, and we don't need to go further. All our businesses, organizations, especially the, you know, when you talk about corporate government, people think it's related to or suited or limited to just listed companies on the stock exchange. No, it shouldn't be just to listed companies. Even individual companies, look, one-man businesses, you should just have some set of rules how you want to govern your business for the obvious advantages. One of which being that the succession, especially family businesses, a key concern should always be succession, but you have some corporate governance practices and code. Succession is to a large extent addressed. Also, for small businesses, you want to go to you, the ultimate ambition of a business is start a business small and, pub, and take it public ultimately. So, if you have a small business and you have the ambition as you should have to make it public ultimately, then you need to begin to embrace. Some put a little, some little governance practices in place, policies in place, and practice them. It helps you to prepare your company for future uh, opening up to the market, as well as helps you to attract both capital, private capital, and public capital into your into your business. So we need to embrace them. We need to come to preach, to preach this. As I said before, governance starts from the top, and so everyone should be. You say everyone's business and not the business of those big, the junior staff. In fact, it's more the concern of uh, senior people. To end, I'd like to draw the attention of everyone here. I, I believe I already must be aware of what I'm about to say. But uh, for others in audience, you know, we have the Federal Reporting Council of Nigeria, FRCN. I believe that organization is doing a fantastic job. And they have come up with a compendium and new ideas of corporate governance practices in Nigeria, what it should be. They have, I understand they are supported, they have an act that uh, empowers them to play that role. They have recently released the exposure draft for how companies should be government in the country, and also for NGOs. I would like to urge everyone who is interested in sound corporate governance, both in public and private companies, and in their companies, and also in NGOs, to 
find time to read this, familiarize yourself with it, and do make your comments known to them. So that together we can have a body, a document that can be Right now we have extra different policies for different regulatory bodies. So what they want to do to bring everything together and want, if it succeeds, it will be very good for us because we need to have a national governance code that, is, uh, that we can all refer to and what we do. So I want to urge everyone here, if you have not seen it, try to look at it. For IOD, I believe IOD must have seminar on it. You've seminar on it already. Very good, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, let me end by saying, again, thanking the IOD for this uh, opportunity to share a few thoughts and comments on uh, some the, the benefits of some corporate governance and to commend it to everyone, both people in business and people in the NGO world. And also to say that what the small businesses that are not yet that in, intent, the, the one-man businesses, SMEs, that are not listed, you're not, you're not excluded from this. You need to prepare your company for the future. And that future should ultimately be when you are able to assess more capital for your growth from others or for the capital markets. We need to set our companies to run to outlive all of us. We need to build Nigerian companies to last. We need to have iconic Nigerian institutions. We need to have institutions that would become future general electric out of Nigeria, out of Africa. That should be our collective aspiration. And we need to have some corporate governance for this to happen. Thank you very much and enjoy your day.